Good morning. As Denise said, my name is Dave Fraser. And I'd like to begin by just telling you a few things you should know about me that are not in the bio. I am not a teacher, and I'm not a parent. I haven't worked in a school, and I work in central services. So I'm probably a really odd choice to be up here talking about empowering schools. But let's give it a try and bear with me. I joined Edmonton Public Schools in November 1990 as a consultant in human resources. I started the day before our support staff went on strike. This meant that I became a full-time data entry clerk for almost a month. When I wasn't entering data, I was on the phone with my former employer trying to get my old job back or looking for a new job. Fortunately for me, none of that worked out. When the strike ended, I hugged our support staff when they returned to data entry. Part of it was it was great to have them back. Part of it was I no longer had to do data entry. But mostly it was because I did not know how they could possibly do their job without poking their eyes out with hot sticks. They were working on an antediluvian system that required entering the same data over and over again. There was lost data, inaccurate data, and there were payroll mistakes. I'm pretty sure the user manual was a set of cave wall paintings. It took so long to upload data, I could make a complete meal in a microwave. And then there were the phone calls and the complaints from teachers and other staff. You get the picture. A number of us thought we needed a new system. So we approached the head of HR and said, he said, well, do some research, put together a business case, and he'll take it to the superintendent. I thought, well, this is going to take at least a year to 18 months. Within six weeks, it was approved, and we were given money and three directives or key performance indicators from Mike Stromditsky, our superintendent. Fix it so it works, be on time and don't go over budget, and you figure out the rest. That was my first exposure to the culture of the superintendent saying, my result, your process. So we went ahead and implemented the new PeopleSoft HR payroll system on time and under budget in less than a year. A few months later, some staff went to the PeopleSoft conference in California. This was before there was Oracle World and PeopleSoft and the conference that attracts like 16,000 people today. There were about 400 people. No one could believe how we implemented the system that fast with so few resources. Other similar sized companies had spent five and ten times as much and taken two years to implement. They also had huge problems in implementation because senior management was micromanaging Departments were fighting with each other, and there was hurdle after hurdle, barrier after barrier. That project was also my first exposure to what could be accomplished in an empowered system. So I stayed with the district and moved into different roles until my last role, where I'm responsible for looking after the operational side of the district. You know, finance, HR, communications, planning and student transportation, facilities, technology, and our foundation. It's my last role because I'll be retiring in the new year. So what does an empowered system look like and feel like from a central perspective and an operational perspective? This is important because at Edmonton Public Schools, we all believe that teaching is a collective responsibility and that the students are at the center of everything we do. We went away from that, and I'll talk about that in our keynote tomorrow. And rest assured, Bruce will also tell you what's working and what's not working. But to illustrate, and being an HR guy at heart, let me share a few examples of the amazing staff who work for us. And please know that if I did this talk a hundred times, I could use different examples each time. We really are blessed with the talent we have. So let's start back in payroll and benefits. We process 14,000 checks a month with all kinds of one-offs and calculations and anomalies, and we're down to an average of about 60 errors, an accuracy rate of 99.6%. How do we achieve that? Because Michelle and payroll and her staff know that if a teacher's pay is not accurate, or there's an error in their entitlements, or they can't access their benefits, then they are distracted and not focused on their students and teaching and learning. Michelle is empowered to do whatever it takes to correct, quickly correct errors and ensure they don't happen again. And she is fierce and relentless. Why? Because it's all about the kids. Let's shift to Kevin, a welder and maintenance services. Kevin was empowered to work all night and through a long weekend to figure out how to fix a 70-year-old boiler in an inner city school 
so the kids could come into a warm building on Tuesday morning when it was 30 below outside. It's also about the grade three teacher in that school who asked all 23 of her students to send Kevin a personal thank you card. Well, Kevin really appreciated the overtime pay. What do you think he appreciated more? It's all about the kids. It's also about Lisa, who you're gonna hear from in a few moments, who asked to come to the annual facility services Christmas lunch so she could personally thank everybody for getting her new school ready to open and for setting up the additional pods and portables when she was bursting at the themes, seams with students. Empowerment's about MIPI, our math intervention programming instrument. Last May, our superintendent was not happy with how our kids were doing in math grades one to nine and wanted to know what could be done to help teachers. Teachers said the provincial standardized achievement tests really didn't help because it was only grades three, six, and nine. They were administered in June, and the tests only really told us what we should have done with our kids from last year. So we pulled together a group of principals, teachers, and central consultants to develop an instrument that could be administered in September that told every teacher in grades two to nine, real time, what their kids know and retained in math from the previous year. So this started last May, and he wanted it this September. We involved central translators to translate the instrument into four other languages, communications put together, the messaging for parents, teachers, and the media. We got district technology to help the team use Google Docs and share sites for collaboration, and Google Forms and Fluberu to administer the assessment online as well as on paper, and collate the data. This was an instrument developed by classroom teachers for classroom teachers. In September, almost 49,000 students completed the instrument, and our teachers had real-time formative assessment data. Each teacher could use his or her professional judgment to determine which math concepts were well understood and we could move forward, who needed individualized support, and which concepts needed to be retaught before moving forward. Was the first assessment instrument perfect? No, but that's not the point. Right now we probably have up to a couple of thousand teachers providing feedback and crowdsourcing the next version of the assessment. Empowerment's about Kathy, one of my colleagues who's an assistant superintendent. When she was a high school principal in a poor area of Northeast Edmonton, she and her staff were looking at a dilapidated welding shop and deeply believed that wasn't good enough and their kids should have access to better equipment. So what did she do? She and her staff worked with the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union, formed a partnership, and they helped finance and worked with facility services to build her a state-of-the-art welding shop. She also secured a commitment from them to upgrade the equipment at three other high schools. Why would a union do that? Because its members are moms and dads and grandparents, and it's all about the kids. Empowerment's about Carlos, a typical head custodian in an inner city school. When I visit his school, the place is immaculate and spotless and clean. When I asked him how he did it, he said this was his school and these were his students. He then pointed to a group of girls sitting in the hallway in front of their lockers eating lunch. He said, if they're going to eat off the floor, then it's going to be the cleanest floor in the district. It's all about the kids. Empowerment's about Terry, teacher at a Northside High School who wanted to do something different in support of our district priority on citizenship and student engagement. With a bit of seed money from downtown, Bruce and I, and the school, he started the Center for Global Education. He convinced Cisco to give him state-of-the-art computer equipment. He now brings students and teachers from across the district and across the country together online and in video chat rooms with supporting curriculum materials to address current issues. Our students have talked directly to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission looking into child abuse in our native residential schools, the government, oil companies, and environments, environmentalists regarding our oil sands development, and the United Nations Commission on Child Soldiers. In a touch of irony, considering this particular moment, Terry approached me last spring for some seed money because he convinced the TED Talks people to have a TEDx in Edmonton, organized by students, delivered by students, and attended by students. It's about the kids. Empowerment is about having thin policy and regulation binders and thin collective agreements. Empowerment cannot be about compliance. It must be about commitment to a shared interest in helping our students and living our cornerstone values of integrity, accountability, collaboration, and equity. Those are our rules of the road. It is about relationships and trust and having grown-up conversations. 
solving problems and issues, and seizing opportunities. It's about always asking what's next and why not. I've given you some anecdotes and I could provide a lot more. They are recent and memorable to me because that is our job as leaders, to be evangelical and always find those teachable moments that create and sustain our culture of empowerment and engagement and honor our cornerstone values. Do we get it right all the time? No. I used to have a full head of hair. <laughs> we work on constantly calibrating and improving moment by moment, conversation by conversation, interaction by interaction, and connection by connection. I wrote this speech last weekend, but I want to tell you about what happened on Wednesday. Sandra alluded to the fact that every year, this was initiated by Mike, we do our results review and our budget plans with our trustees. So it was my turn with my groups in Central to meet with them. And our board chair turned to Noel and, he, and she said, you know, Noel, can you just tell me a little bit about what your role is and what you do? And he said, well, I support the schools in terms of ensuring that they have proper financial controls in place and I make it as easy as possible for them to implement and I ensure that the principal has confidence in those controls so that he or she can work with their teachers to meet the needs of kids. I then had two of my, my budget manager and one of my managers of accounting talking about how they streamlined the budget process to make it easier for principals and how she was so proud that she was able to go through the budget and go through the grants from Alberta Education and figure out how to get the last possible dollar into the hands of our school principals to meet the needs of ELL students. I mean, these are my frickin' accountants and my manager of internal audit. Yes, they get. <laughs> So let's shift to a few numbers because almost everyone loves to see and do the math. There's been a lot of talk about the state of employee engagement these days. A recent Gallup poll indicated that 30% of workers in the United States are engaged in their work and the other 70% are not engaged or actively disengaged. We participated in an employee engagement survey a couple years ago. 67% of our staff are fully and actively engaged and when you add in the nearly engaged, the number rises to 86%. And it turned out that 90% of our leaders are engaged. And to give you an idea of what that looks like and what it could mean, I don't know what it's like in Hawaii, but there's a lot of issues in Alberta and Canada about trying to retain those bright and new teachers five years into the profession. Our attrition rate is less than 1% for the last 12 years. That's we retain 99% of our teachers. Two other findings were interesting, where we scored higher than the best employers in Canada and the U.S. 84% of our staff scored high on intrinsic motivation when they answered the question, I get a sense of accomplishment from my work. And 79% of our staff said they truly enjoy their day-to-day -day work tasks. Your findings are probably similar in terms of intrinsic motivation. In fact, the irony may be that when you heard me talk about my Michelle and Terry and Kathy and Carlos and Kevin, you were thinking, wait a minute, we also have a Michelle, a Terry, a Kathy, a Carlos, and a Kevin. So our staff and your staff show up every day wanting to do their best work because they are motivated and they care about kids. What happens when they walk through the door? Are they encouraged and trusted and do they have the autonomy and support and safety net to unleash their talents and be quick, nimble, creative, and innovative, to be a risk taker? Or do they face barrier after barrier, hurdle after hurdle, which sucks the motivational soul and lifeblood out of them? What happens when they take a risk and make a mistake? Are they chastised or punished? Or are they supported and reminded that, in falling flat on their face, at least they were moving forward? In order to create and sustain an empowered school system, you need, on one hand, just enough bureaucracy structure, policies, processes, and systems to generate some efficiency in economies of scale and not a smidgen more. And on the other hand, a culture that has the heart and the soul of a startup that allows, they encourages, and trusts your teachers and other staff to bring their aid game, make the right decisions, and do their best work in support of teaching and learning. Why? Because deep in your heart and gut, you know that everybody gets that teaching is a collective responsibility and it's all about the kids. 
It really is that simple and that complex. And that's what we'll spend the next day and a half talking about. The good, the bad, and the ugly about how we got here and where, we're, where we are going next. Sandra and I will talk about our reorganization that began in 2010 and the role of strategic planning in our keynote discussion. A couple of cautions before I finish. As Sandra said, if you're looking for a magic or a silver bullet from those of us who are up here, you will be disappointed. The answers do not lie within us. They lie within you, all of you, and everyone who is part of your system. It has to be your journey and your culture based on your context. We may have some process tips and concepts or models that may be helpful as you have your discussions and sort things out. And I look forward to participating in that dialogue and learning from you because I steal great ideas from everybody. In fact, I've already poached a couple from Los Angeles and Clark County and I look forward to stealing from you. <laughs> also, don't worry about waiting to get it right, just right and perfect. To borrow a great military analogy, no great plan survives first contact with the classroom. You always have a plan B and are always calibrating, improving, and finally, don't get caught up in the tyranny of the or. This should not be about who has the power, schools or central. This should be about and, empowering the whole system and everyone in it, all staff, all parents, all students, and the community to work collaboratively to support teaching and learning. Everyone should get that the starting point is that it's all about the kids. My name is Dave Fraser, and although I am not a teacher or a parent, I am so damn proud to have supported teaching and learning for almost 25 years. Mahalo.